the Baltic level. And now we're going to discuss, uh, I'm going to sort of introduce the project that we're uh, working on here in Norway and uh, the discussion that we want to raise for this afternoon. Uh, we've called this project, I'm working with Simon Toip here and then on the Yaldrum. Uh, maybe you should just say hello so that everybody sees who you are. Um, so there's three of us working on this. Uh, we've been giving support from the environmental department, Espen Koksvi, who's the representative there, to do this work. And it's in collaboration with Norsk uh, Ökosamfund, and there's one representative here at least, and I think there's another representative from the board, Trudande, of course, and Euros on the board. Um, and it's all being filmed. Here, so and all these um, these talks will be put on the website of uh, NEF, which is Noshka or something. So they'll all be available for everyone. Um, so we've we've had we decided on a very active title because, as Ross and Helge said, we're fed up with reports that don't end up in doing anything. We want something that is very action based. We want to find out how can we establish more eco villages. Um, and, um, yeah, Shivila asked the question, why? This is, uh, <laughs> why? Um, and um, as uh, 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 Ross and Hilde have shown their, or the GEN definition, um, when we look on a Scandinavian basis, uh, certainly uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland. In Sweden, the eco villages have a tendency to be much more material, more technical, um, uh, although there are all sorts of examples. Um, and I think it's important to say that there are no eco villages that can do everything, but all eco villages have aspects of many different things, and it varies an awful lot. So it's actually quite difficult to define very, very clearly what an eco village is, but it has aspects, many different aspects. This is, um, I'll just translate it. Eco societies are the newest and most um, uh, vibrant form of um, uh, conscious or uh, what are they called? Goal Goal, yeah, but it's uh, it's more uh, intentional communities. That's the word I use in English. Yeah, it's actually very difficult to translate the other way. <laughs> um, and so they connect two fundamental truths: um, uh, human life is at its best in small, supportive, uh, healthy local societies, and the only sustainable way for humanity is to refine and uh, improve the traditional village life. Which I think is actually a very, very um, nice definition. Um, we mentioned um, that there has been a lot of, quite a lot of research. Um, this is uh, from a Danish um, research project, which was looking at purely CO2 emissions, and it's comparing the Danish average with the eco village average, Moussa Gård, which he did mention. Svalholm were the three that were uh, looked at. And as you can see, they are dramatically lower than the average. And probably, if you, this is actually only a small, small part of what the eco villages are doing. If you really looked at the holistic side of it, you would find even more. Uh, there's also um, uh, some research from England, Scotland, and from the States, uh, where they've looked at the ecological footprint. And they all confirm this, that it's actually, we're looking at um, uh, projects that achieve the goals that they're setting out to achieve. So there's something very important that's going on here. And the Danish, our Danish colleagues, they've coined this phrase, which I think is important, is lifestyle changes as a climate strategy. And especially in Norway, I think this is actually quite important because in Norway we have a very, very strong focus on technological change and technological innovation that is supposed to save us. <laughs> and we sort of forget the social aspects, uh, the human aspects. Um, and this is actually saying, it's not saying that the technical things aren't important because they are, of course, important as well. But it's saying that, in fact, our choices, our lifestyle choices, are maybe the fundamental basis that we have to um, uh, work on. 
And uh, I think maybe because there's a lot of insecurity in you know, looking at social innovation, looking at how people can change their lifestyles, um, this is not focused on. I mean, I'm an architect, I work with buildings, and we know that uh, you can save 40% of your energy bill just by you know, turning off lights, lights, changing your lifestyle, putting on a jersey, all those things that don't cost anything at all. They're just a choice that you make. But nobody proposes them. Nobody talks about them when we say we're going to design an energy efficient building. We don't talk about the, the, you know, the human aspects of it. We talk about the technical aspects. And it's a bit the same you know, when we're designing uh, housing habitats. And I think this is actually a very important uh, mental shift that we maybe have to make is to look at the social processes, the human processes, much, much stronger. Um, so this is what a, you know, um, we've actually decided uh, in Norwegian context to use Verkelsonfen, which is also used in Denmark. It's an eco-community. And basically, um, it's a definition that encompasses not only an eco-village, which is very often an entity maybe in a rural situation, but it also includes urban um, communities, people who are maybe linked much more to a local community, not as a defined you know, entity, but maybe more like the transition town movement, for example. And I think that's also important that we have a fairly open um, you know, idea of what this can be. And I think what you were saying should be about um, you know, how can we not only include the eco-village entities, but other people who are interested and want to make these changes, I think it's very important. Um, this is what Hilda shows. I don't really need to go into this because you've been through this. But I think this is important, it's very fundamental. It's uh, in, in sustainability, we always talk about the three folds of the bottom line, which are the social, economical, and ecological things. And in addition, of course, here we have this worldview, um, which I think is very important. And I agree with you there, I think it's absolutely uh, critical that we do have a concept of having to live you know, within the boundaries we have on this earth and you know, taking care of people, taking care of the earth, very simple ethics uh, are important. Um, so it's actually a four bottom line, <laughs> which I think is, is something we should uh, insist on introducing or be you know, very clear about. Um, this is one definition. Um, Eco-communities are urban or rural uh, communities that try to integrate a good social environment with uh, a low-impact lifestyle. To achieve this, they use different aspects of ecological design methods, permaculture, ecological building, green production, renewable energy, energy sources, um, social processes, and a lot more. And another one, um, a local society is, that is formed consciously through local ownership, uh, participation processes that regenerate social and natural environments, and where the four sustainable dimensions, the ecology, the economy, the social and the cultural, are all integrated in a holistic approach. Yeah. Who made that one? I think that's just from Jen. <laughs> I should, have, I should have acknowledged it. I'm sorry, I put it uh, in the report, it will be acknowledged. So anyway, I think uh, what's typical in what Ross was also saying is what's typical in this is these are very often grassroots movements. Um, nobody's going to come and save us. I think we've all realized that after the last real meeting. It's not, you know, the top down is not working for many, many reasons. And Ross is going to talk about that tomorrow. But um, we really have to act uh, on a local level. And these projects, they have, all these are just sort of elements of this. You, you want to have your whole life in one place. You want to have a mixed use functions. Um, so, you know, having somewhere to work is just as important as having somewhere to live, as you we were talking about, producing your own food. Um, community, being together, um, living together. Um, getting rid of all our, our pathological transport <laughs> systems <laughs> that are taking over our cities and our areas um, and bringing back people, healthy housing, uh, buildings, growing your own food, of course, very important. 
renewable energy sources in all sorts of forms, local natural um, sewage treatment systems and water treatment systems, um, and as Hilda mentioned, this whole uh, new movement that's very similar, the Omstillings uh, period in, in uh, Scandinavia, and transition time movement. So the question is, how are we going to help these sort of initiatives in a Norwegian context? Um, there's a question of whether we can create some sort of a model. And I don't think, um, I don't think there's one model. I think there are many models. But we have to start looking at what these different models are. Um, maybe trying to be you know, very, very um, practical. Uh, you know, how can we actually do it? Um, these are all sorts of connected initiatives, and I've sort of sorted them out a bit in, uh, in the different challenges that we face. Uh, very many projects have a challenge in finding financing. Um, most of the projects, certainly the Norwegian initiatives, and many of the, um, the other Scandinavian initiatives are initially privately financed, which means very often it's one person or two people that provide the initial capital to buy a place or um, start a project. Um, and that is not uh, sustainable. It's often a very, very difficult position to be in. Um, there are some private banks in Norway. We have a representative, the Kutuda here, yeah, there. <laughs> uh, one of our only banks that maybe supports this sort of projects. But unfortunately, they're very small. They don't have enough capital to support all the initiatives. Um, so we have some questions, you know, would it be possible to create some sort of foundation? This was suggested in Denmark to create a foundation. It didn't actually get off the ground in Denmark, it was understood. Never, uh, they never actually got the money for a fund like that. Um, in Norway, uh, we had a very interesting situation after the Second World War when one wanted to um, create housing for people. And Husbanken was the tool of the Norwegian government to do that. And Husbanken still exists, but it now has a very different role. Uh, it's changed a lot. But would it be possible? Um, Husbanken has actually given support to uh, certainly Hurdal and several other uh, eco village initiatives in, a, in an initial phase. But you know, could there be other ways of organising the financial situation? There are also, you know, in Russia, Norway, and Norway, there are various um, public funds, but they're not necessarily geared to um, the eco-village or the eco-community level. So, you know, looking at this whole whole area of financing is, is quite important. Um, what's also been an experience in Norway is that you can get funding up to a certain level, but the last 5-10%, which is what um, finance will call the risk capital, you know, where they're taking a risk. It's not doesn't have security in property or whatever. Um, there are very few institutions that are willing to give that capital, and that can actually be enough. That final five to ten percent can be enough to stop many projects. So, you know, for example, having some sort of a guarantee um, for that risk capital. Because um, the interesting thing that we just had a discussion in Brøset, uh, up in Trondheim, which is where they're trying to create a new um, area of Trondheim town. Um, and it's exactly the same. All the big commercial companies are saying, you know, we're worried about taking the risk to make these, these, um, uh, you know, these ecological projects because we don't know whether they're going to sell. You know, they're worried about uh, the future of them. Uh, in fact, you know, as Hilda was saying, very often these projects are very good investments, they're very secure investments because you've got people who really want to make them work and, and who, you know, their whole lives are there, so it's actually a very secure investment, but, but that's not, uh, the con you know, that's not the, uh, the, the view that these sort of uh, companies have or the big structures have. Okay, then there's the whole question of organisation. You know, how do you organise yourself as an eco-village? Um, in Norway, we're lucky to have um, this Bulibiglag and Buretslag, which are co-housing or um, systems, which in many other countries are regarded as being incredibly radical and quite difficult to organise. In Denmark, they existed uh, for a long time, and in other Scandinavian countries. 
but um, we do have a legal system that actually you know, supports that, owning land in, as a common property, um, having a right to live there, but not necessarily owning your own house. This is, you know, legally in law is, 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 is okay. But these fully big love, like Ubos, um, they are now huge commercial companies which actually act almost the same way as any other commercial builder would. Um, and in Brussels again, we had a discussion about this, and we had some of the German um, projects came up. And the people who, in the Norwegian Wollebegelag, they said that these German um, uh, co-housing projects are very, very similar to the first ones in Norway in the 50s. So he was quite nostalgic about it. He thought this was fantastic. <laughs> they were really, you know, they were almost the same. So it means that, you know, we have a route there, we have a system there that probably can be used, but we maybe have to, you know, organize it in a way that makes it, uh, or it has a specific goal that this is what we want it to do. Um, the Camp Hill uh, system. Stiftelse. Yeah, Stiftelse, yeah, sorry. It's a, what's a Stiftelse? That's a trust. Trust, trust in uh, English, yeah. Um, we got lucky to have two representatives here from Volusion who are going to take part in the discussion. Um, they are maybe the most successful story here in Norway because they have most villages. They've been going for very many years. Um, and I think in the afternoon we're going to have uh, our start to maybe say a little bit more about it. Um, uh, and I think their model is also very, very interesting for us. Uh, we should look at it. It's a form of trust. There are very many projects that want to organize themselves as trusts because that means that then the profit has to go back to the project rather than being taken out of the project. Uh, but it also has you know, some limitations. Um, and then there are these Sambirke Ambris log. There are you know, um, several different possibilities for organizing ourselves. But again, it's, you know, what are the good sides, what are the bad sides? Most people coming into this are amateurs, they're not necessarily, they don't know anything about the legal aspects. You know, how, how do we, what are the good ways and how to get more information on this? Um, work, uh, important, very important. It's uh, obviously, you know, the people living in eco-communities want to create uh, a livelihood in some way or another. There's some very interesting um, examples. The Ebola network from the States, which is a um, uh, business alliance for local living economies, is a wonderful network that's set up where um, uh, small businesses within local areas connect and network um, to support each other in, in creating um, local industries. Uh, very successful in the States, uh, finances itself, almost no support from the government. Um, they were here in Norway this spring, we had a meeting with them, and uh, there's some people who are looking to maybe create something similar here in Norway. Uh, Hurdal has looked at this sort of the idea of the Hurdal Valley, not just the eco village in itself, so very much what you were talking about, how can the eco village link into the local economy, uh, all the other local producers in the area. The slow food movement, very interesting, um, has spread all around the world. We have a Norwegian association, um, has many similar uh, uh, sort of bases to it. Uh, local food, promoting local food, local products, um, without um, pollution and so on. Um, community uh, farming or gardening systems are really growing in Norway, there's a lot of them, or they're, they're popping up the whole time. Uh, very interesting connections between you know, housing, urban areas and farmers who can then um, have a, an assured market for their products and people can come out and take part in you know, the different seasons and fetching their own food. And then, of course, you have the, uh, all these um, let systems, local exchange and trading systems. There are some that uh, exist in Norway. Uh, they're interesting as uh, a method. And there are a lot of the existing eco-villages um, have systems for this because they don't want to be dependent on, the, on the, the money economy. They want to create a local economy. 
And they also want to create systems of feeding back um, the income into their own economy. So um, that's an important, one of the, another important part of this whole, um, uh, yeah, the holistic look. So then I sort of looked at some of the different levels. Um, this is the, the public, um, on the state level. And uh, there are barriers, there are quite a few barriers and, I should say, um, things that we have to uh, look at. Um, it's quite often very difficult in the Norwegian context to have a housing area connected to a farm because there are various rules about conserving land and not so many houses in connection with farms that can be different, difficult. Um, uh, so the question is, you know, are there things that should be looked at? Again, you know, suggestions for public policies, the policy makers, are there things that need to be changed to make it easier to establish eco-villages? Um, are there financial, um, uh, you know, ways of financing or helping the financing situation? Guarantee funds, um, uh, Hibden mentioned pension funds, you know, which can actually be, maybe, could be a very, uh, it's certainly in England they're looking at that, and to maybe put pension funds into supporting projects like this. And also, just to even formulate a, a public policy which says, you know, precisely what you're saying in the Baltic project, that eco-villages or eco-community projects are an important step in attaining uh, a more sustainable lifestyle or a more sustainable development, and um, uh, achieving the climate goals. Uh, even that would maybe be a step, you know, in a direction that would make it much more acceptable for other parts of the legislation or the, you know, the uh, public bodies to make it easier. In Norway we also have the regional context. Um, I've had uh, certainly one project which was stopped at the regional level um, because they didn't want housing um, on a small farm. It didn't matter that the small farm wasn't being used and hadn't been used for many years, um, but they didn't want housing there, and it was just a sort of full stop. Um, so, um, you know, obviously this has to do with protecting um, arable land, which is certainly, um, you know, obviously an ecological goal. We don't want to build down arable land. But very often you can put, certainly in a Norwegian context, there isn't much arable land. There's an awful lot of rocks and forests and areas that aren't very good, often very close to the arable land. So very often you can put housing, you know, quite close to arable land still, uh, not build it down. And of course, you know, you can actually um, increase the production if you have a very intensive gardening system. Also, there's this, what's known as somewhat in the transport, which means that we want to collect um, housing uh, around public transport systems, which is very sensible, obviously, uh, from in many ways, but it may not be, when you're talking about establishing um, uh, an eco-community, which one the most important thing. Uh, it's important to think about, but it's, it's maybe not the most important aspect. So again, um, trying to suggest public policies, uh, about allowing eco societies, and then on the um, uh, the municipal level, um, there are suggestions that um, can one uh, or could municipalities actually actively um, set aside areas where they say, okay, we would like to have an eco village development here. There are many examples of that now that are turned, coming up in certainly in England and I think in Denmark too, where municipalities are actually saying, okay. We've put aside an area and we want somebody to come and establish an eco village here. Which obviously takes away one of the big problems, which is actually finding a place, you know, a site where you can build your eco village or make your eco village. So that's, uh, in, in some ways, you could say Hudal actually started that way because the municipality said, okay, we have a farm and we would like you to come here and, and, and develop. So, you know, that is actually an active policy that local municipalities can. Uh, can do. And also, again, formulating policies that would allow projects like this to happen. So, these are all the very many different levels and some of the challenges that we're going to spend this afternoon discussing. I think that's um, final. I think what's important is 
Um, you know, we've, in the introduction this morning, we've been talking on very many different levels, and I think that's very important. We have to be aware of what are the right things to do on which levels. There's a role for everyone. You know, things have to happen on all levels. So I don't. You know, it's important not to let them negate each other, but see how we can make the different levels support each other. Um, the private, the public, um, again, we need them to connect and support each other, not work against each other. Um, so there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, need for coming together and discussing this. So, this is the basis for this afternoon. So we're going to have a break now for lunch until uh, 1.15. And I think it's now beautiful outside, <laughs> so we can go out. Yeah, you do. Do you want to just say oh, one more? Way, one more thing should be taken into consideration, and that's to set up research projects that, that are necessary, that would much promote the whole idea. Yeah. Because absolutely. I think there are many areas that really need research. Yeah. Well, we don't have the answers. Yeah, that's right. And that by formulating that and, and putting out to universities and like maybe this knowledge is not there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's also the, the idea here is, you know, that these 10 projects, and hopefully we could get any more of them, they could be sort of pilot projects that could, you know, uh, show um, and also be a part of the research project. So, and I think also the, you know, it's again all this information that you're making, that, that Gans has made, you know, there's a lot of resources here that somehow need to be made available to people and also, you know, do more research. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. This is a very good structure and I think it's, it's uh, necessary to define which level we will continue to discuss. Mm -hmm. Just a uh, uh, a uh, question about policy and national policy. I think the government is supposed to deliver uh, uh, a new policy or a white report to the, to, to the parliament this winter about housing policy in Norway, and there's a, a debate going on now. Have, have you discussed uh, some principles or some five challenges or something like that to the government about the barriers or, or about the, the legal or maybe economical aspects about this, how to build down some, some of the uh, clear defined barri barriers. Have you discussed that or will yeah, that be maybe a result of this workshop? Yeah, I think hopefully it will be the result of this workshop. I think I've, I've only got five other copies. I sent this out before I go your on. This is a, a sort of initial, um, the initial report. It's not finished by any means, and, and what's coming out in, of the discussions here will be very important. But this, um, we've, I've put, um, it has three chapters. It's, first of all, it's sort of defining what is an eco community. The second is the challenges, especially in the challenges. Um, we've tried to sort of look at what are the things, the barriers that have been stopping eco-age projects. And I've also been getting, um, I've written to all the initiatives that I've been able to find in Norway, and I've got feedback from very many of them. A lot of them are in a very initial phase, a very early phase, so they still haven't sort of reached all the practical stuff. <laughs> um, so we don't know yet, but uh, that's also giving information to this. So that we're getting information from the actual projects in Norway on what's happening. And then uh, the final is solutions, possible models and strategies, um, where we're trying to look at you know, what can be the possible models. So uh, if anybody hasn't had this, I've got five copies here at least. Yeah, so you can, you can uh, maybe we just divide them between the different groups. Like, and then, uh, and then uh, as I said, they've been sent out um, you know, as, as on the uh, internet, so obviously it's been made available and finish it. But we haven't finished it yet, so this is, as I said, it's just an initial first first one. So I'll give one to each group. But um, the idea after lunch, anyway, is that we want people to sit around the tables in a group. You can choose, not everybody's going to be here after lunch, but um, um, you can choose, obviously, you know, which group you want to be on. It might be good to, you know, people from the same projects divide themselves at different tables. Um, it might be good to have, uh, uh, everybody seems to manage English okay, because I think um, uh, it would be good for, to have our resource you know, people maybe in, on different groups, that would be great. Um, so, you can make some connections during lunch and then afterwards we'll come back yeah, in an hour and um, and then 
just uh, sit around these. I think it's probably um, six groups, uh, five or six groups. You should be at least four or five people, I think, per group. So.